Hi, my name's Abigail. I've just been doing a little bit of Sup, Abigail. body modification work. Welcome to Velocity Body Modification. Every now and again when I'm out and about in the world, I'll see somebody say something and immediately think, that's got to be an episode of the show. Usually it's somebody very passionately defending a philosophical viewpoint without necessarily realizing the depth of what they are saying. And to me, that's like the bat signal. I grab my tools and I go to work. I want to pop the hood on what they've said and take a look at all the philosophy inside. And today I have... Philosophy Tube is the Batman of philosophy. ...found a doozy. There's a British website called Mumsnet. It's a forum for parents. And a while ago, there was a thread that started with, Mother is a social construct. Discuss. And one lady wrote, Carrying and birthing my child was not a f social construct. Well, before we do anything, the definition of mother by Google is a woman in relation to her child or children. She returned to Bristol to nurse her aging mother. Bring up a child with care and affection. She didn't know how to mother my brother, and he was very sensitive. Dated. <laughs> so this is the dated definition. Give birth to. I think that's, uh, you know common in our uh, everyday understanding of what a mother is who's your mom who's your mother who's your mom uh, it's it's the one who gave birth to me of course do you mean biological mother or uh, mother in another sense well no I mean my mom like the one who gave birth to me and I saw that and I was like oh philosophy tube time baby this lady was actually making a metaphysical claim metaphysics is the bit of philosophy that broadly looks at existence so if ethics is how do i be a good driver and aesthetics is how do i make my car look cool metaphysics is what are cars what are they what are mothers is there anything that can be said biologically or factually about nature at all or is everything a social construct? Are mothers a social construct? To birth, the outdated definition. To birth a person is to be a mother to that person. Is that a metaphysical construct? I'm not sure, but let's keep listening. What are they made of? How do they work? If you were to take a class, you might look at things like causation, free will, space, and time. I once had a metaphysics lecture where the professor argued that time does not exist, which was very funny because, no joke, he turned up 10 minutes late. <laughs> so when I saw that comment, I wondered two things. Firstly, what is a social construct? And secondly, why do people sometimes have such strong feelings about them? Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> Whoa, that um, transition was a little spicy. I'm not digging the font. Definitely not digging the font. I'm liking the aesthetic of the video here. Definitely not the font to go with it. Just saying. Philosophers draw a useful distinction between an object and its properties. This car is silver. It has the property being silver. I could paint it a different color take that property away, give it a new one, but it would still be the same object. You might well wonder, how many of the properties can we take away before the object is gone? If I give this car new paint, new engine, new brakes, new electricals, is it still the same car? That's the kind of question a metaphysician would think about. For now though, you understand this distinction between an object and its properties. And there's different kinds of properties too. Some we would say are intrinsic. That means you can't really separate the object from the property. It's an intrinsic property of triangles that they have three sides. If you right, so we might still say no matter what you did to the silver car, it remains a car because it drives you around and gets you from A to B. Whether you change the parts in it or not, it may be a new car or a slightly new car or shades of gray in between, but it's still definitely a car or an automobile. 
you take that away, it's not a triangle anymore. Others we would say are relational. This car has the property being next to me. But if I move, then it doesn't have that property anymore because it depends on my location. If this car was my favorite, we would say that it has the property being my favorite. Well, you could also say it's your favorite, but it's also next to you in your heart. So you move away from it, but it's still in your heart, you know, intrinsically. It's still there. It's a piece of you. Take that car away and you, you remove a piece of your heart. Which is not only relational, but depends on my feelings rather than my location. And now here's the million dollar question. What kind of property are things like being a woman, being a man? I don't know. I'm a little afraid to answer this question given who's uh, discussing it as of now. Um, this is obviously a ContraPoints ripoff. Not to say that this person transitioned to mimic ContraPoints, but they have a lot of the same characteristics about themselves. The way they construct their videos, the accent, the um, over-the-top, um, luxurious way they shoot their videos. So, yeah, anyways. Being black, white, gay, straight, whatever. Are they intrinsic? Are they relational? Are they something else? What do they depend on? They are pretty important. I guarantee that properties like that have shaped your entire life. They've sure as hell shaped mine. So, what the heck are they? In offering my theory of social categories, the aim is to reveal the cogs and belts and arrangements of parts in machines that often are oppressive. To start solving this puzzle, we can do something that philosophers love. And if you enjoy this, then you should absolutely study metaphysics, because this is like half of it. Imagine another Earth called Earth 2. And on Earth 2, they have all the same ideas we do about sex and race and gender, all those same categories, but they also have an extra one called Schmite. Schmite is very simple. There's two kinds of people on Earth 2, bigs, and minis. Bigs is any adult over five feet tall, and minis is anyone under. And let's say that whether you're a big or a mini. So like midgets. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, small people or tiny people or little replicas of normal people, right? Really affects your life on Earth too. Like if you're a big, you can get a better job, you can get a nicer house, you're allowed to marry whoever you like. If you're a mini, life is hard. Suppose we were to meet the people of Earth too, and we said, Schmite is just a social construct. Being a big or being a mini, those are clearly relational properties. They depend on how other people feel about you. They might say, no, it's not. It's not about feelings. It's objectively observable. Look, I have a tape measure. I can tell whether someone is a big or a mini. Reaching tall things on my shelf is not a f***ing social construct. But we might come back and say, okay, yeah, you, you can measure somebody's height. Nobody's denying that. But what we're driving at is, why do you care? Why have you constructed your social systems around this feature? Maybe you've got a good reason. Uh, stop you there. Okay. Yes, it may be a construct as to how we act upon those factual statements or those factual properties of people, big or small. But the fact of the matter is, is that some are smaller and some are bigger. And the relation we draw in between those things may be constructed. But the fact that one is bigger than the other is as factual as a statement you'll ever get. There is a seven-foot person and there is a four-foot person. That's a factual, observable thing in the universe. And it's our attitudes about those things that may be constructed, but not the actual physical evidence, I would assume, right? Reason for it, but on Earth One, we don't do that. We have the property being tall, but we don't have the property being a big or being a mini. So you guys must have invented them. And all the Earth 2 people will be like, you guys are weird. Meanwhile, the people of Earth 0 are looking at us going, whoa, what's all this stuff about race and sex? 
I mean, we understand skin color and reproductive organs. Yeah, we're not erasing anybody's biology or anything like that, but you guys divided your whole population and you, you based your whole society around this? <laughs> Why? And maybe we'd say, well, it's, it's evolutionary psychology, you know? On Earth 1, some of us can carry children, some of us can't, so we evolve different societal roles and, and we, we make that distinction. Carrying and birthing a child is not a f***ing social construct. And they might go, okay, yeah, but what about Mother's Day cards? Okay, wait, before we go any further, I like where this is going. I like the whole setup, how she is next to, he is next to a um, a car here. Um, I, I enjoy all of this. It's very well done. But, um, yeah, that's usually how something would work. It's not like you can force things into existence. You can through conditioning, but the way things play out in a system like humanity would be the fact that Women can give birth, so there are certain roles given to women, and there's certain ideas that surround that premise of the fact that they give birth to other human beings. So it is biological, it is factual in the sense that that does happen. What we have to say about that is an entirely different story, but what we have to say about that isn't necessarily completely departed from the idea that they are women who give birth or they are a person that gives birth so society acts in accordance to that if a man says well i'm going to give birth to this child it's a misnomer it, it's a contradiction it doesn't make sense and we know that via the fact that the factual evidence is there to say that what that person is saying about a man and what we know of a man cannot give birth. So we would question that idea. Just the idea of where she's going with this, with social constructs is very interesting. But there are reasons that we have certain constructs or certain ideas about biological facts that you just can't simply get rid of by entering in a, a, another species from another planet where they men and women can both give birth. Because on this planet, only one does. I mean, are you seriously telling me that you evolved to buy each other those? Get out of town. There's definitely some aspects of being a mother that you've invented. I mean, there's nature, you've got your natural properties, yeah. But then you guys, you've added a whole bunch of stuff on top of that. You're doing augmented reality shit, like projecting extra properties onto the world. On Earth Zero, we don't have any of that. We've just got the natural properties, no additives. And then suddenly, in come the people from Earth negative one. And they're like, whoa, hold on there. What's all this stuff about natural properties? The only reason that the people of Earth two bother to measure height, the only reason they have a concept of height is because they care about schmite. The act of measuring someone's height isn't a neutral thing that happens before they get assigned big or mini. When you measure something, you're already assuming that there is something there worth measuring. So these supposedly objective natural properties of yours are also social constructs. Yeah, well, that would be like saying, what's the meaning of life? Uh, if the meaning of life is to survive, which it's um, taken as usually, the survival of the human species would be to say that there were tall people that could reach fruit in the trees and the small people couldn't. So we measured that by the people who could reach the fruit in the trees and those who couldn't. So it was a fact of the world that they were living in that the tall people could reach the fruit and the short people couldn't. If a another species comes in and says, we don't have that problem, actually, all the trees are on the ground, and it doesn't matter if you're short or tall. It wouldn't take away from the fact that the tall people on that planet have to be tall in order to reach the fruit. So it wouldn't be a social construct. It would be a fact of that world and that reality of those people living in it. One person could reach the food and the other couldn't. <laughs> right? I mean, if I'm getting anything wrong here, go ahead and let me know. It's not augmented reality. It's full VR, son. On Earth negative one, we don't have any of that. We're all just 
just vibing. Just vibing. Presumably, life on those other Earths would look a little bit different. If you were walking around Earth too, you'd see signs with like bigs only and stuff, cause social constructs shape our environment. Suppose we took a whole city of people here on Earth One and we erased their memories so they didn't know about sex and race. Would they reinvent those categories when they saw their environment? I would say absolutely yes. Without a doubt, I think they would. It, it, it comes with our own nature, uh, what it means to be a human and to think. It means to put things in categories and what makes sense and what doesn't. So it makes sense to say, these people over here shoot fucking human beings out their bodies while these other people don't. So we're going to categorize that as a certain subset of the species as a whole. So this certain subset of species can shoot babies out their vaginas and these ones have penises and they can't do that. Now there're going to be certain, you know, areas of gray in between that. But that doesn't mean, it doesn't get rid of the fact that that one category does exist. Would they look at public toilets and go, oh, hey, there's two different spaces here. But in our homes, we've only got one. What's up with that? Would they go, oh, hey, we've got darker skin and we all live on the bad side of town where the houses aren't as nice? Why? Our social constructs have shaped our environment which in turn reinforce our social constructs. I think that was an episode of Star Trek, actually. So we've identified this whole layer of reality, which really affects our lives, but which we seem to be just inventing, at least to some extent. So- Yeah, I would say to some extent you're inventing it, yes. You could say that the uh, people who birth other people and we call that something, we are inventing a name for it. We're inventing a category for it. We are observing reality and we're putting a name to it. Uh, but I, I, I definitely wouldn't say that it's socially constructed in the way that she's trying to convey it as. You know, if we took away the idea of sex and everyone was left to their own devices, uh, this knowledge previously being taken away that we would never come up with these categories again. There's a reason why the categories were invented in the first place because they're useful. They're useful tools to explain what is happening in the environment. What is going on? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If you ask three philosophers how social constructs work, you'll get four theories. So we're gonna look at one by a philosopher called Oshta. She's Icelandic, so she only has one name. I chose it not because I have any particular attachment to it, but because I think it's interesting and it'll give you a flavor for how philosophers tackle these questions. It goes like this. Suppose that you're watching a game of baseball, which if you've never heard of it is like cricket, but it's even worse. The guy who throws <laughs> like the one. ball, the bowler, he throws it towards home wicket where the nice. batsman is and he hits it and the bowler has to throw the ball within a certain zone and if he gets it in the zone and the batsman misses that's called a strike and if you get three strikes then you're out but it has to be in the zone if he throws it up here then it doesn't count and if it's very yeah it's a ball something you have <laughs> close to the zone all the spectators go oh my god was that a strike and then the umpire has to decide. Oshta says there are natural properties about the trajectory of the ball. She calls them underlying properties or base properties. So she's thinking more augmented reality than full VR. The umpire is trying to keep track of those underlying properties. And in order to do so, he confers the social property being a strike onto the pitch when he says, Strike one! So according to Oshta, being a strike is a social construct that serves some purpose in the game by keeping track of the ball's underlying properties. Similarly, on Earth 2, being a big is a social construct that serves a purpose. Okay, I want to interject here. Um, 
bigs are a natural property, let's just say people that are tall are a natural property of that world, strikes, a strike zone, is completely made up. There is no strike zone that exists in reality. There are proportions that exist, but we have made that up for a game in which there are actual dimensions to a strike zone, but there is no actual strike zone that exists in the universe. And there may be no bigs that exist in the universe, but there are proportions that are recognizable without inventing them in the first place. So someone is this tall without ever having to come up with the idea of height. Height is understood by living in the world where baseball has to be learned. So someone who's never come to Earth would be like, uh, yes, this person is... I have to look up to this person to see how tall they are. If you were to introduce them to baseball, they could learn the rules by watching the game, but they're never going to understand the strike zone without those things being put in place in the first place. So a strike zone has to be made up before someone can come to a conclusion whether it was a strike or not. No, Nothing has to be made up about someone looking up to another person to see if they're taller. In a social game, by keeping track of people's height, each of us has a lot of features, and only some of them matter socially in a particular context. Examples, I'm 168 centimeters tall and have shoe size 39. I have short hair and I'm wearing black pants. I speak English with an Icelandic accent. I'm extremely nearsighted, have moss green eyes and pale skin, breasts, broad shoulders. Some of these features matter socially in a context. Others do not. What is it for a feature of you or me to matter socially in a context? The answer I give is, a feature is socially significant in a context in which people taken to have the feature get conferred onto them a social status. That last bit is important. Baseball's one thing, people are another. Properties like... Be yes, I, th I think we can agree with that. Baseball's one thing, people are another. Being a woman, being a man, a mother, black, white, that's not a game. That's your life. Consider the property being cool in the context of a high school. If you're cool, you might be able to get away with stuff that other people can't. But at the same time, there could be expectations on you that might be stifling. It's a lot of pressure being cool. I imagine. <laughs> it's pretty clear how you get a strike in baseball. It's less clear how you become cool because there aren't really any rules. People just start treating you differently and you thereby acquire coolness. Nobody really decides it either. There's no umpire at the school gates going, you're cool. It's just the community decides to confer coolness on you or not, maybe even unconsciously. In baseball, the umpire was trying to keep track of the underlying properties of the ball's trajectory. On Earth 2, they were trying to keep track of the underlying property of height. But what is the underlying property of being cool? Well, there probably isn't just one, right? It's probably like a vague bunch of things, like wearing the right clothes and having the right attitude, liking the right music. Right, but cool wouldn't be the same thing to everyone. But a strike, as we know in baseball, is the same across the board. So yeah, to be cool is subjective. It's ultimately subjective, but to get a ball or a strike in baseball, that is something that is very clear, not necessarily as the umpire sees it, but if we were to play it back to see if it was in a strike zone, as much as we could measure, we could definitely say that it was a strike or a ball, where if someone is cool or not, or if someone's funny or not, if someone's pretty or not, these are way more subjective statements, way more of a social construct of if you're a mother or not and you birthed someone else. So the fact that someone's cool or not definitely is not related to if someone gave birth or not, right? So in, in the most philosophical sense, you could say there's really no difference between a mother and a father 
it, we only place those differences uh, societally because one gives birth. But that would be a rejection of all science and and all evidence based thinking. It would just it's science is a social construct. Then um, everything is a social construct at that point. If we're gonna go that deep down philosophically. Everything, anything and everything is socially constructed, right? So if you want to go that route, you could say that, but you're also negating so much of what science and what truth is, which is a lot of what philosophy is to begin with. It's not really a set list, and you don't have to have all of them. Philosophers actually have a word for this vague bunch. It's called a homeostatic property cluster. It comes from biology. Think about a word like mammals. Mammals have a whole bunch of properties. We have warm blood, we produce milk, we give birth to live offspring. And if an animal has enough of those properties, we say, okay, that's a mammal. Well, what about the duck-billed platypus? But it's not a hard and fast list. The duck-billed platypus. <laughs> I fucking knew it. Yes, these are classifications that are not complete but a duck-billed platypus does swim or does it not a duck-billed platypus was uh, does have a beak or it does not and you could say a beak is a socially constructed property well what does a beak make up a beak could be many different things that we classify uh is it alive or not well is it brain dead or is it <laughs> Is it actually alive or is it in a coma where it's um, on the verge of life and death and we can't really say because it's brain dead, it's alive. If you want to get down to the nitty gritty of all things, you can say that everything is socially constructed. But again, that is just that's just throwing science and evidence based thinking out the fucking window. We have to classify things at a certain level. So would philosophy tube say that? mammals are a social construct and so are beaks and so is fur and so is being able to swim or not because can you swim or can you not well i'm not really swimming i'm just kind of floating in the water is that swimming <laughs> if i'm drowning right before i actually dip below the water and drowned was i swimming <laughs> it's it is the it's the part of philosophy that's is um obnoxious it really really is but you know let's continue lays eggs but it's definitely a mammal who decided that is there a platypus umpire no sadly it's the community again the scientific community the philosopher richard boyd says the whole point of classifying animals is to be able to predict and explain things about them yeah, that's what science is. Uh, it's it's based on predicting things, right? So that's the science game, if you like, and that's why homeostatic property clusters are so useful. Properties in the cluster tend to occur together in nature, either because having one causes you to have the rest, or because there's some underlying mechanism that causes them to occur side by side. And by the way, we do classify um, a duck-billed platypus as a mammal, and there are a few other mammals that do lay eggs, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they are... They originate from the same place as duck-billed platypus. There's lots of uh, evolutionary theory on it, but I'm not going into that. So, if you know that an animal has warm blood and it gives birth to live offspring, you can predict X, Y, and Z about it because the properties tend to occur together. When European scientists first encountered the platypus, they were confused. Some people thought they were faking, others thought they belonged in a category all their own, until they realized they had so many of the other properties in the mammal cluster that if you want to win the science game, you've got to classify them as mammals. On well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there is male and female duck-billed platypuses. Whether they lay eggs and are classified as mammals is a different story, but can they reproduce and who does the reproduction would be the answer of who is male and who is female. On Earth Zero, there are no mammals. They know about warm-blooded animals, yeah, but mammal is a social construct that we use to keep track of certain underlying properties. And on Earth Zero, they 
play the science game differently so they don't use that social construct. On Earth negative one, they don't even have the underlying properties. They're all just like, bro, have you seen these platypuses? <laughs> these things are adorable. <laughs> okay. They're weird animals, I'll give you that. Remember earlier on, I was talking about how the high school- Philosophy tube is like a duck-billed platypus. Where, where do you categorize them? I'm not sure. The community confers the property of coolness on you? Or the scientific community conferred the property of mammal on the platypus? What if communities disagree? What if someone was like, actually, the only important thing for deciding whether an animal is a mammal is whether or not it lays eggs. What if the anime club think that you're really cool, but the Quidditch team don't? Are you cool? Are you a mammal? Why not? Oh. <laughs> I love the, the reference to looking at herself in the mirror. Am I cool? Am I not? Am I doing philosophy right now? I think I am. Shta says, there is literally no answer to that. There are underlying properties about you, but the social property of coolness and what exactly is in the cluster we're attempting to track depends on the game we're trying to play, which might not matter so much for being cool, but there could be some other social properties where it might really affect your life. I'm sorry, this is very boring. Um, yeah, I can see where she's getting at with the identification of <clears throat> male versus female or mother. But as we know it, we could we could just describe the properties, right? She said underlying properties of yourself. So we could just describe those underlying properties of mother as giving birth. You know, we could say that one that gives birth is a mother. Well, then you might ask yourself, well, are you a mother if you don't give birth and you adopt? Yes, well, then we we would say that given the idea of the original statement, one who gives birth and, you know, rears a child. But ultimately, we don't want to just say the underlying properties every single time we want to speak a sentence. We don't want to say, uh, the one that gave birth to me, I will be giving a card to on the day that we recognize for the people that gave birth to others. We're gonna come up with a classification, something like mother, something like male, something like female, something like mammal. And it's very, very useful. Some of that may be socially constructed, but it is socially constructed on the basis of a existing reality that we construct socially norms and labels around that. But that does not get rid of the bare bones things that exist there in the first place, like one that gives birth. Now we can consider someone who adopts to be a mother to a child, but what we actually mean by mother originally is one who gives birth. And usually females are the ones that are mothers because they have those reproductive organs. Now should I say this person has such private parts, such reproductive organs to where they have the opportunity to be a mother? Or should I just say they're female? I mean, we can beat around the bush here all day long, but we're going to come to the same conclusion and that it's easier to speak in ways that we do. And that's why we socially construct things. But that doesn't make the underlying factual statements that we're making any untrue just because we give fucking words and language to them. You know? And, but that's philosophy for you. If somebody refused to confer them on you. We've been talking today about baseball and platypuses, but obviously what we're really talking about is sex. Yes, and race yes, I, and gender I, I, I and all that I understood that completely. When I wrote the script, I deliberately went a bit more abstract with it because sometimes when we talk about social constructs, people get really angry. Like, remember earlier on, I talked about social constructs being full VR rather than augmented reality? That was a reference to a philosopher called Judith Butler 
They wrote a famous book in the 90s called Gender Trouble in which they argued that sex is a social construct as opposed to a biological natural property. It's a pretty fascinating book. It spawned a lot of interesting philosophy. Maybe we could talk about it in detail another time. But people get so angry about it. Even today, people protest Judith Butler, which is wild. I mean, nobody ever protested Socrates. Everybody loved him. Unfortunately, some of the people who get angry about social constructs aren't really making a philosophical argument so much as they are trying to rationalise a dislike of trans people. Especially in my country, the debate about who does and does not have the property being a woman or being a man isn't really about metaphysics. It's just a kind of proxy way of deciding whether people like me get healthcare and human rights, which... I think that's just some bullshit. I, I just thoroughly, thoroughly think what she's saying is bullshit. They are recognizing an underlying property, like she said, that we constructed to say that this group is one group, this group is another group, and we don't mean that to be bigoted. The people who are saying that trans women aren't women, we aren't saying that you can't treat a trans woman as a woman societally. We, you know, I'll call you miss. I've been calling you she throughout this. Maybe I've made a few jabs at the fact that um, you still might have a penis. Maybe I do that. But the only reason I'm saying that is because I recognize that maybe you haven't had a sex change. Maybe you still do have a penis. So it would be ridiculous for me societally to call you a woman and not on the basis that I'm bigoted, on the basis that we recognize women through time as someone who doesn't have a penis. That's all. It's not that I hate you, dislike you, philosophy tube. I'd sit down and have a beer with your ass. It's just the fact that you are pushing against the grain of a long history of us recognizing a certain underlying property of biology by a certain label. Now, if you want to fight back against those labels and say, I'm still a woman even though I have a penis and can't give birth, well, then that's your prerogative. But you're not going to convince people overnight that what we've been calling a woman for forever um, all of a sudden doesn't mean what it means anymore. You're fighting against definitions and definitions in language more than you are social constructs. And I guess that what that's what language is, is a social construct. We choose to call certain properties certain things. But I still wouldn't I still wouldn't if you if you have a penis and and and, and had a tit job or if you all of a sudden decide to become trans, yes, I will recognize you as a woman. I will treat you as a woman but not so much to where I actually treat you like a woman if you know what I mean so that's where it really comes down to it there's some trans people out there that will actually say uh, that you should treat me like a woman all the way up to where I, I believe it was in a ContraPoints video where she talked about the um, the woman penis and about the soft feel in your mouth these are not social constructs what people feel is not a social construct it's what they feel to be true in reality and it's based off what they observe and that's science okay now if we want to get into categor categorization or classification we can talk about social constructs but when it comes to you still need to treat me like a woman even though i have my dick in your ass or my dick in your mouth you're no longer talking about social constructs you were talking about simple biological facts and science and i'm sorry to say and if you if you don't believe that then you're just no longer talking about science you are talking uh, philosophical nonsense to the point to where it your brain becomes numb um you can philosophize philosophize things into the ground to where you create contradictions and paradoxes but in reality and how we have to live and move forward as a society, certain things need to be said concretely, matter-of-factly, uh, as a matter of fact. And to say that now Philosophy Tube has, is now a woman, even though he was a man just a year or a few years ago, that's not taking away your identity. It's I, I'm not going to say that you're not a woman. If you feel like you're a woman, you want to be a woman that's that's your prerogative but when it comes down to the classifications that we've had throughout time and if i were to have sex with you 
there's going to be a big difference between me knowing if I'm having sex with a woman and understanding and understanding I'm having sex with a man. And that and that is going to be obvious. It's it's going to be very hard to miss if you know what I mean. 